This is Rogers TV. Welcome, everybody, to Canadian Sober, eh? I'm your host and resident alcoholic, Dougie Fresh. So glad you're with us today. So when somebody joins recovery, it could include a ton of things, um, struggles. I, I can tell you my first year in Alcoholics Anonymous or in AA or any other recovery program, it was a struggle. Um, and some of us have more struggles than others. And some of us have it really, really easy. Um, you know, it just depends on the way it goes, I guess. Um, I had the opportunity to listen to our next guest's story um, last week, and I can tell you that this guy is the real deal, and he's here for the real reasons. And um, and I'm so blessed and glad that he, he wanted to join us today. So um, please, at home, eating your popcorn, give it up for, uh, for John. How you doing, John? I'm doing well today. Thank you, Doug, for having me. Oh, I'm so glad you're here, man. Thanks for being here. Um, so can you tell the uh, the world that's watching who John is? Well, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a fellow who um, was, um, unfortunately, I, I, I grew up in a, in a real uh, traumatic, um, in a traumatic way, right from the get go. Um, I, uh, I survived a, a plane crash at the early age of two and a half. And um, I was with my mother and my grandfather. And, um, and so as a result of that, uh, that tragedy, um, you know, it, it, um, it really uh, kicked off um, a whole lot of uh, pain, uh, a whole lot of dysfunction um a whole lot of hurt in my world and uh, as unfortunate as it was you know um i believe today um it's it's my fortune really um i consider myself um i consider myself a miracle in more ways than one um but that plane accident um you know uh, led me to uh, a, a long stay uh, a long, um, a long history of, um, of, um, uh, visits at sick kids hospital in the burn unit. Um, there was a lot of, uh, yeah, there was a lot of pain there and, uh, and, and not just myself or, or my mother, um, but my, my immediate family, my household, uh, the, the family in the household was, was very, uh, um, affected as well and uh, so there was a lot of uh, a lot of drinking um that i was around once i once i left that hospital um you know i basically went into a home that um that was riddled with alcoholism you know by my father and uh and so there was a lot of fear uh, there was a lot of confusion and um you know there was a lot of um, abuse going on and um physical mental emotional and uh so it was really unfortunate in the beginning for me um uh, like i said there was a lot of confusion because i was so young and i didn't understand what was happening around me or, or even to myself at that point right um all i knew is that i was different um from from a lot of the other kids um and so having that feeling of indifference um really um was really unsettling for me as well it, it created a lot of anger um it, it um i was like in survival mode you know and uh being in survival mode um at that age or during those years of of childhood and 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 right through my whole entire life really uh it, it brought it brought on so much um i i just refer to it as insanity really um you know um uh, eventually you know uh, the family split and uh, and i went with my mother i had two older sisters i was the youngest of three at the time and uh and so um you know um 
in those days, uh, my father was the breadwinner and and um, and whatnot. So my mother went on with her life with us three kids and uh, on her own and 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 really struggled, um, really struggled to to provide financially. Um, I remember going to school, no lunches. Um, you know, just um, just a lot of um, not having the material things as most kids would have. Uh, you know, I never had like any kind of new bike for per se or uh, any uh, designer clothes or anything like that. that. That was just not even that wasn't even possible. Um, so so really, I, I grew up real fast, real, real hard, um, whether it was in the schoolyard uh, fighting or in the neighborhood fighting. Um, I, um, I was, um, constantly stealing from other kids, uh, while, while on recess, I remember one particular, um, time in my life where there was, um, it was, it was normal for me to go back into the school while on recess and, and go into other kids' lunch bags and lunch pails and whatnot and, and take food while, while no one was around just so that I could eat. And, um, and, and, you know, I, I, I just, that was like the norm for me, you know, I just, you know, I, I just, that was just my life. And, um, I, I really didn't see any other way or know any other way. And, um, so that, that, um, that really, that really created, um, a lot of, um, alcoholism related characteristics if you will right and uh so as time went on um you know and i got introduced to to alcohol at around the age of 12 13 years old um that that was a sense of relief for me that that effect um really um had a, a sense of um it was like an escape for me um because what was going on inside my mind and my my body was 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 turmoil. It was pain, and um, and I had um, just a sense of feeling of of um, ah, you know, when I when I uh, started um, drinking at an early age, um, and, and and you know, it just started out like a weekend type of. Um, events you know with these uh with these older kids that i would hang out with in in the neighborhood and and um but you know um you know having those um ism type characteristics at such an early age that um weekend fun really turned into um uh, quickly turned into um any chance i could get I would, I would want that effect, you know, I would escape, um, how I thought or how my, how I felt. And, um, and, you know, um, the family, um, was very, um, dysfunctioned, like I mentioned. So there was a lot of times where I was, uh, in trouble, um, at home, um, you know, and, uh, and I sustained a lot of, um, physical abuse, a lot of mental abuse, uh, emotional abuse as a result of just uh, the pressures of life. Um, you know, my mother didn't have it easy by any means. I know she did the best she could, but, um, you know, um, when it was all said and done, it was just a really, really unfortunate upbringing. Um, you know, and, uh, so any chance I could get, I would, I would drink, to escape my 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 thoughts, my emotions, and um, and so it caused a, a great deal of of uh, of pain um, on top of what I had already been experiencing from within, and uh, so I quickly got myself into trouble with the law. Um, I it was sixteen years old, and I was um, I was facing some pretty serious charges, uh, alcohol related, of course. And, um, I was always a blackout, um, and the effect of, of alcohol had, had always given me this blackout effect. So there was, I, I didn't even know, um, you know, I was so out of control in so many aspects within my own mind and my own body. Um, so I, I, I was introduced to, uh, to the law at the age of 16 and, and, you know, like, um, 
by this time I had suicidal thoughts. Um, I hated my life. Um, I hated who I, who I had become. I hated that survival mode. Right. And, uh, so I was always constantly lashing out, like I said. And, uh, so the, the, the troubles with the law came, uh, really, really, uh, quick in my life, the early age of 16. And, um, you know, by this time, um, you know, my father wasn't um, wasn't able or capable of of giving me any attention, so I I, I had this sense of neglect, and um, you know, it was uh, it was tough. It was really really tough. But uh, I was first introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous when I was sixteen, and um, you know, I just couldn't get uh, I couldn't get it, and. Uh, so my troubles and and with the law continued. I found myself involved with um, with uh, motorcycle clubs like the Hell's Angels and the Red Devils, and uh, I quickly got onto their program. And um, you know, just the troubles just continued. But um, my ins and outs of of Alcoholics Anonymous at an early age finally led to me wanting to. Uh, and the insanity of of alcoholism, you know, and um, I, I've finally been able to uh, maintain some some continuous sobriety, and I was um, I was fortunate enough to have a a, a large uh, support network, and um, so today, you know, uh, being clean and sober, um, I uh, I facilitate meetings at our local detox center. And I'm able to be a service and I have a sponsor, Rick M. And I work closely with him on a daily basis, a uh, weekly basis. And for me, it's just all about um, giving back, you know, because my, my life was so riddled with, with, with tragedy and trauma. Um, I, I quickly want to mention that I'd lost um, uh, my sister uh, my, uh, my father and, uh, my half brother, all, all related, uh, or indirectly, uh, related to alcoholism. So, um, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where that miracle I believe is, uh, uh, you know, is in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, there's been a plan for me all along. And I truly believe that, uh, my, my mess is now my message and I'm able to pay forward a message of hope. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's been, it's been a ride, you know, it's been a ride. It, it hasn't been, um, it hasn't been easy by any stretch of the imagination, but, um, you know, uh, sponsorship and a home group has really allowed me to feel a part of today and, um, which I wasn't able to have that sense of part of feeling, um, in my life. So, uh, today, you know, living clean and sober has been, hasn't been easy, but it's been well worth it. Oh, that, that was amazing, John. Um, you know, thank you so much for sharing your, your story with us. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when I was talking with you last week, um, I couldn't, I don't know if I told you or not, but I, um, a lot, you and I share a lot of similarities in, in our stories. And, um, and, and, you know, when I ever, when, whenever I share my story, people will say, you know, how did you, how were you that person? And then this person today, you know, like, like, yeah. how have you transformed basically into, you know, the person you are today? And um, I always uh, throw it back to the fact that um, I had such a hard upbringing that um it it made me a different person and it showed me a world that I didn't know existed and and now that I know it exists um I don't want to go back there you know and I don't want anything to do with it so um yeah you and I are are, are similar in a lot of ways and um you know uh when when you shared that moment about your sister um uh passing away in 1993 um share with me a little bit on that like um like how old were you when when she passed away and and what was going through your mind when that happened i was um i had just turned 18 years old and um again um you know i i was uh, i was in trouble with the law 
um, I was at a, a tail end of of a of a sentence, and um, and so um, yeah, my sister um, she had her own struggles with with uh, alcoholism and, and addiction, and um, and she you know she struggled uh, real bad, and um, and she couldn't find uh, she couldn't find the the gift of of recovery. And so she ended up in some serious uh, abusive relationships, and and that's what took her. And she was murdered. Um, uh, she was beaten to death and sexually assaulted to death by her uh, by her partner. And um, you know that that uh, event itself um, to watch uh, my mom, especially my mom, um, the pain and and. Um, uh, that was very, very devastating for me. The effect of watching my mom, um, and and just knowing um, or having this v vision of what my sister had gone through that particular night, the events that 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 um, unfolded that night, um, and not being able to be there uh, mm. was was really uh, was really traumatizing. Really, mm. really traumatizing. Yeah. I can't imagine, um, you know, uh, going through something like that. Um, you know, uh, you, you had such a, uh, like you mentioned, you had such an upbringing with the law and, you know, uh, detention centers and, you know, all this other stuff. Um, you said you, you work at a treatment facility or you volunteer at a treatment facility right now. Yeah. What's it like volunteering at a treatment facility? And when you see somebody that comes in that maybe reminds you of you, um yeah. is your approach to them a little different than maybe somebody else i'll tell you um you know all the years of my ins and outs of of alcoholics anonymous um uh, you know it was just always about me and 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 um and so the difference between then and now being um being sober today um i i'm able to um I'm able to to use this uh, service work at the detox center. Um, it's it's just so beautiful. It's such a beautiful experience, and it enhanced my recovery. It enhanced um, uh, hope. It really delivers um, a sense of hope um, for me, as well as uh, these men and women in the detox, because like I shared, um, my my recovery this time around has not been easy by any stretch of the imagination. Looking at myself and who I was and who I had become and and um, and going through all that mess, um, you know, um, and to be able to come out onto the other side um, and still share this message of hope with people, even while I'm struggling within my own recovery, um, it's just, it's just a miraculous thing. It, like, it's just amazing. And, and I've had some really strong feedback from, from the clients in, in, in the, in the detox. And, um, you know, it's like one, one alcoholic helping another, you know, yeah. and, uh, I see myself through these other people. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. It's just amazing how, this gift that I've been given, um, how it just uh, flourishes, you know, from within, right? From yeah. within, and uh, it touches a lot of people. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just a miracle, man. It's, it's just a miracle work. Yeah, it really is. I, I, I bet it's, uh, it fills your heart a lot, and uh, you know, makes you, uh, makes you feel that you're, you're, you're giving, you're doing a difference in the world today, John. Um, you know, and, uh, I'll tell you something really quick. Um, I don't think I've ever shared this with you, but, uh, the first time I spoke at a treatment recovery center, um, was, uh, I think in season two of Canadian Sober A when I had the podcast and, um, after I shared my story, one of the patients there asked if she could go grab her cell phone and, uh, they let her go get her cell phone and she brought her cell phone to me and my podcast was her screensaver. And, yeah. and it was, it was one of the weirdest kind of like weirdest, exciting moments in my life. And I thought, oh my goodness, I have a stalker. And, <laughs> and I, was like, I was like, what's going on here? Yeah. Um, but I have, I've spoken to that lady uh, since then. And um, 
And she said, you know, she was grasping at straws. And um, somebody said, you know, there's here's a podcast, like maybe, maybe you should listen to it. And um, she had listened to every episode um, up until that talk. And, uh, and it was just uh, one of those moments, I'm sure you've had a couple of them where you felt, um, you know what, I think that I think that kid's gonna get it. You know, or I think that person's gonna get it, you know, um, yeah. there's certain uh, a grit you see in people when when they're in treatment facilities and 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 centers and stuff and i've spoken at a few now um but you can tell almost which ones are there to actually get to work and which ones are there just to get people off their back is that would that be kind of true to say absolutely absolutely and 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 listen you know like um the rewards for me um i'll tell you uh, is not only going into the detox and 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 sharing but the most rewarding part is um, seeing some of these people attend Alcoholics Anonymous meetings after they leave mm. and stay sober for two, three months, or, and, and they're on their journey, right? Now, I don't take any credit for that because all I believe is that I'm just a channel. I'm used as a channel of of of, of hope of, mm. you know, if I can do this, anybody can do this, yeah. right? Absolutely. And so it's just a beautiful thing, especially, like I said, seeing them leave that center and take that courageous step forward and, and change their lives around. Right. Yes. Yeah. Now, um, I've had a question. I don't know why I've never asked this question, but I think you're the first guest I'm going to I'm going to ask this question to. And it's more or less for the for the individual sitting at home or watching this on YouTube a month from now or, or doing whatever. Um, in your definition, in your words, what would you consider an addict? What would you consider an alcoholic? Uh, someone that has uh, zero defense against any thought or um, any physical, um, uh, yeah, just just no defense against against uh, the the substance itself. You know, I used to look at people straight in the face with with true meaning. I'm not going to drink today. I don't want to drink today. I don't want to drug today, and end up drugging or drinking, right? Mm -hmm. And I truly meant my words, right? But I had no defense. I had nothing separating John from John, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. really, it's that obsession that that uh, would definitely define my alcoholism or my drug addiction yeah and that's would you say like that's that's the mental health side of it right like that's that's where you know they they tell us that you know addicts can't be alone by themselves in their own thoughts no you know it's the worst place to be <laughs> <laughs> yeah right um i i had somebody tell me one time they said you don't know what it's like to relapse and i looked at them and said i relapsed every day of my life before i came into the program right like yeah. Every day I said I wasn't going to drink and I wasn't going to use. And yeah. guess what? I drank and I used, you know. So if you were to put, uh, and I know it ranges with different people, yeah. if you were to put a number on it, um, you know, you know, like when you go to the doctor's office and he gets you to fill out that form and he's like, you know, how many drinks do you have in the week? And, you know, <laughs> and you you lie on it and you say, you know, I have like three, you know, like, like, what would you say? daily the number would be that you would you would maybe consider an up somebody an alcoholic um you know that's that's a good question because i find that uh there's different different uh types of alcoholics you know um but i mean anything that um that starts with one ends with whatever that number may be right so yes. it's that first drink that really is the is the one that takes us right yeah so you know um for me it wasn't about how much i could drink it was about picking that first one up knowing what it's going to do to me right yeah that that the, the obsession of more right yeah. i want yeah. more that um, physical um, allergy yeah yeah hey honey i'm driving out to i gotta go pick something up at canadian tire but you're not telling her you're going to the beer store on the way you know exactly. like exactly yeah that you know, mental whatever. that mental obsession that physical allergy where it's just more more and more and more right yeah but it yeah. always starts with that first one for me absolutely right? yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah um you know, uh, we don't have much time left, um, but tell me a little bit about uh, what you do on a daily basis to make sure John stays mentally and and physically, you know, fit 
in in uh, in in your day to day life? I, I I'm I'm I need to be spiritually fit. Um, uh, part of my story, you know, uh, my whole story basically was uh, that hole in the soul. Uh, I had a broken soul at an early age. Uh, so healing that uh, on a routinely basis really allows me the opportunity to um, to have that defense against any kind of uh, substance, you know. Uh, that's huge for me is that the spiritual side for me is is where it's at if i don't have that that power plugged in um you know i'm not plugged into that power i'm i'm done you know yeah. and i know it and i know it so so would you say service to you in the program is is a huge plus one thousand percent yeah one thousand percent helping others yeah getting out of myself yeah yeah and uh, and so, like, you've done all those things. You've done all the do things. You have a normal job. You have a normal life. Um, you know, and uh, and you're doing, you're doing great work in the program, and you're doing great work in your life. And um, you know, I think sometimes we don't credit ourselves enough because we want to stay humble and we want to like, we don't want to like over gloat it, right? Like, we don't want to like, you know, saying I'm the best, you know, which is yeah. never never the case, but, um, you know, I, I'm sitting here today, John, after listening to your story and knowing you for a little while, you know, you're, um, you definitely are a recovery warrior, my friend. And, um, you know, I, I hope, uh, I hope, you know, you mentioned struggles, you know, we, we all go through struggles. I can tell you that I go through struggles eight plus years sober, you know, um, you know, so just keep on the, Keep on the right side of the tracks. Um, keep doing the do things, and uh, you know, I I'll I'll, I'll see you at the party someday, hey, you know, you and and, and you we'll bet. have a coffee and we'll uh, we'll hug it out, and um, you know, I'm just grateful to know you today. I really appreciate you having me on, Dougie. I really do. Oh yeah, man, it's it was a blast. Thank you so much. Right. Thanks everybody for joining us today on Canadian Sober. Eh? Join me next week when I'll have another amazing guest like John on. Um, and we'll chat a little bit more then. Peace and love, everybody, wherever you are. See you next week. is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Connect with us by visiting our website or email us at comments at rogerstv.com. October 5th, 2014, my daughter was hit by a train. She was walking along the sides of the tracks and it shattered her world. <laughs> Hello, I'm Liz Dowdswell, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. In 2008, carbon monoxide, a deadly invisible gas,